Dear Heavenly Father, 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 why do giraffes look so funny? Thank you for preparing horses on the earth. Please bless the mic guys to be good so they will be resurrected. Please help me to never go to the dentist. Thank you for Grandpa's birthday. Bless the day. Give me apples and I clap my foot too. Thank you for all the doggies. Thank you for the ice haircut. Please help Christmas to come soon. Thank you for the baby's haircut. Thankful for my cat that lets me dress him in my clothes. Thank you for Jesus' haircut. Please help us to have pancakes in the morning. Please bless the toothache can come. Please protect us from big hungry sharks, tsunamis and lightning, vampires, fires and tornadoes, and mean fish in the ocean like piranhas. Please bless me not to grow a beard. Please bless that the girls won't try to kiss me at recess anymore. Please bless for me to not get cold this Christmas. Thank you for kitties. Please tell Jesus to bring the dinosaurs back again. Please bless me with more trials because I know that's how I grow. In the name of Jesus Christ. In the name of Jesus Christ. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Well, I love hearing the prayers of kids because quite frankly, you just never know what you're gonna get, right? What's truly on their hearts and their minds is like a stream of consciousness. Uh, I have uh, four kids and so our dinner and bedtime routine and our prayers, uh, you just, again, never know what you're gonna get. Sometimes you get the standard, you know, thank you God for mommy and daddy and my brother and my grandma and grandpa and my cousins and my teachers and just anybody that they can actually recall to mind. And you're just like, I'm hungry. Please say amen. Um, <laughs> is that wrong for me to think that way? I'm a pastor. What's going on, right? Other times you get things out of left field that, you know, you hear it and you think, you know, I'm really glad they said that because I wouldn't have thanked God for that. But it's a good, good thing. Like, thank you, God, for my toes and rainbows. Thank you for Garbage Guys and American Ninja Warrior. And uh, that's kind of what's going on in my house. Rainbow is an American Ninja Warrior these days. You know, as a, as a skinny kid myself growing up who hated the cold, and if we're being honest, as I'm a somewhat lanky adult who still hates the cold, uh, I appreciated that one boy's request in the video. He said, God, please let me not be cold this Christmas. And so I say amen to that. But at the very end, you might have caught something that one of the girls said in that video. And she said this, she said, please bless me with more trials because I know that is how I grow. Is that a prayer that you've prayed late recently? Is experiencing, again, more trials for stronger faith something that seems appealing to you or will that you be willing to go there? Well, if I have to be honest, uh, myself, I feel like I have a hard enough time handling uh, the trials that are already in my life let alone trying to pray for more. Well, is that something that you would want to pray for today? Is that something that you're willing to go to and say, God, give me more trials so that my faith can grow? Well, we're in a two, well, three week series and this is kind of part two of that. And last week, Josh defined prayer as saying that prayer is simply going along with God. And when things are going well, it's all good and well to go along with God. You're getting what you want, rough, the road isn't too rough or bumpy. But what about when things aren't going so well? Right? When you have really deep prayers because the circumstances in your life are not going great. When you're experiencing things that maybe induce fear or pain or panic. Simply put, what do you do when the stuff in life is kicking the living stuff out of you? It's in those moments that you and I, we have a choice and it's our choice and it's our choice to make. It says, will we put God between us and our stuff or will we allow our stuff to come between us and God? Right? We have a choice to make. And this is the question I, I really want us to wrestle with. Will you put God right, between you and your stuff? Or will you allow the stuff that you're experiencing to come between you and God, especially as it relates to prayer? Inevitably, if we've prayed for any length of time, we, we hit that conundrum that we all face. What do I do when the stuff that I'm facing seems so overwhelming? And when my prayers seem like they're just bouncing off uh, a ceiling that isn't being answered, right? 
Does it mean that God's not listening? Does it mean that God's not there? Or even worse, that God is there, but he just doesn't care. In those moments, the stuff that we're facing can seem so pressing, so urgent, and really inescapable, that that is when we're most tempted to have the stuff in our life come between us and God. And in those moments, what are we going to choose to do? Are we going to allow that stuff to put a wedge between us and God, or will we come to God and allow him to be what we focus on and cling to? Now, I think that God wants something better for our lives than absence of connection with him. I think he wants something more, something better, something even mysteriously beautiful about praying to him in the hard times of life. And so today, I want to just allow us to have four different biblical people shed some light on this whole issue of how we can pray when the stuff in life uh, seems so difficult and when it starts affecting our prayer life with God. So first, let's uh, hear from a guy named James, and I want him to show us why putting God between us and our stuff is so important as we pray to him in the difficult times. Uh, For some background, James was a a literal brother of Jesus, and he became an important leader in the early church. And this is what he says in James chapter 1, 2 to to 5. He said, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, when you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. And let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. If any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to him. Again, going through hardship, it's not pleasant or fun or easy. In fact, it hurts and it's hard and it's painful, but our pain doesn't have to be pointless, right? Our prayers to God in those times can achieve for us some of the purposes that God wants to accomplish in us as we go through these painful trials. You see, James says that, you know what, it's actually not just possible to survive these things, but to actually somehow experience a joy in the fact that we're going through painful trials because, like that little girl said, God, give me more trials so that my faith can grow. And James is basically telling us that a strong faith is worth the pain it takes to get there. Now, I'm not necessarily the poster child for Fit Nation down the road, but uh, I do know a little bit about fitness, uh, enough to know that actually building muscle starts by having it being broken down. See, what you do is you go to the gym and you you lift weights. I definitely could not lift that much weight. Um, But you go and you put your muscles through strain, through hardship, And then it's actually the rest period following that exercise where your body starts restoring and building up the muscle stronger than it was before it went through that exercise. In the same way, our hardships and our trials, our spiritual exercises that God puts us through for the purpose of helping us to gain strength spiritually as we turn to him and then rest in him through prayer. Now, knowing that God wants to Right, build up our faith rather than tear it down as we go through these hardships, that doesn't necessarily change our circumstances. Uh, if you were with us last week, Josh talked about a study that said, hey, here's a group of people, these people were prayed for, these people weren't, right? And they looked at the outcome of their physical illness, and there wasn't statistically tons of difference. But what it does change is it changes the way that we encounter our struggles. That's why James says in the next verse, in, in part five, he says, if any of you lacks wisdom... You should ask God, you should pray to God and ask him, right? And he will give generously and without finding fault. As we go through our trials, God wants us to turn to him in prayer and ask him specifically for wisdom. Wisdom, again, that we get without God saying, you don't deserve it. If we pray to God for wisdom, he'll give it. But what is wisdom? Does it mean that we ask God, okay, God, just show me the way, I'll do it, and then magically things go away? and things are all better. Well, absolutely, that's not the case. That's not our experience. That's not how this whole prayer for wisdom thing works. So what is wisdom? Listen to Proverbs 1, 7. This is what it says. It says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. What the writer of Proverbs is helping us understand about James's encouragement for us to ask God for wisdom is that if we want to live wisely, no matter what circumstances we're facing, we need to start with the fear of the Lord. Now, some of us might have backgrounds thinking about the fear of the Lord, and we might 
think certain really negative things that we need to cower in terror as though God's going to strike us down with a lightning bolt anytime we tell a white lie or steal a pencil, okay? That's not the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord, though, is to rightly comprehend who God is and all of his power and his goodness and his holiness and his perfection, and then to rightly understand ourselves in light of that and then to respond appropriately with our life. You see, when we get a clear picture of who God is, that shapes our view of ourselves and our circumstances. James knew that if we were going to not just survive our trials, but thrive in them, we needed to ask God for wisdom. That's how we can put God between us and our stuff, and not our stuff between him and our, and our, and our, and our situation, right, between God. And when you do that, God will graciously give you the wisdom that you ask for. So that's why, right? In the midst of our trials, we pray to God. We ask him for wisdom. And in so, he aligns us with who God is so that we can encounter the trials we can in his power. But how do we do that? What does that look like really practically? And it's easy to say, okay, God, I want wisdom. Help me understand what you want. But what does that look like? How can we actually be true to wanting God's best for us and yet our hearts and our minds are going through tons of frustration and anxiety and pain? How can we do uh, what God is asking us to do by coming to him when we hurt so much. Well, I'm grateful that we don't have to guess at that, uh, but that we can have uh, examples of that in scripture. And so I want us to look at uh, a man named David, and I want to look at a psalm that he wrote when he was in a really bad spot in life, and this is Psalm 142. Uh, this psalm was written likely after the situation that he found himself in because he was uh, literally running for his life from King Saul, and uh, King Saul was this guy that he, David had helped by killing Goliath, and that was a good thing. And yet he's running because uh, Saul wants to kill him. And things have gotten so bad that he's now literally hiding in a dark cave. And so he's reflecting back after this time on his experience in the cave, and, and these are the words that he writes. Um, but before I read it, what I want to do is I want to have us put ourselves in David's shoes, right? Just pretend you're there. You're in this cave. Uh, it's cold at night, it's really hot during the day. You're tired and hungry. You're unable to rest for days on end. People are out there, not just Saul, but people around you that are just waiting to capture you, not just so that you can be tried, but so that you can literally be killed. You're going through this hardship, and by the way, it's hardship that's unjust. You haven't tried to threaten Saul whatsoever, but he feels threatened by you. And now all of a sudden, you're supposed to pray to God. You're supposed to reach out to him as though God is good. How are you going to do this? Well, this is now David's prayer. I'm going to read it, and then we'll walk through it. Psalm 142. With my voice, I cry out to the Lord. With my voice, I plead for mercy. I pour out my complaint before him, and I tell my trouble before him. When my spirit faints within me, you know my way. In the path where I walk, they have hidden a trap for me. Look, look to the right and see, there is none who takes notice of me. No refuge remains for me. No one cares for my soul. I cry to you, O Lord. I say, you are my refuge, my portion in the land of the living. Attend to my cry, for I am brought very low. Deliver me from my persecutors, for they are too strong for me. Bring me out of this prison, that I may give thanks to your name. The righteous, they will surround me for you will deal bountifully with me. This is David's prayer, and, and it, it kind of shows us four things that we can do as we seek to put God between us and our stuff rather than that stuff coming between us and God. And the first thing we need to do is to cry out consistently to the Lord. Verses one and two, David says, with my voice, I cry out to the Lord. With my voice, I plead for mercy to the Lord. I pour out my complaint before him. I tell my trouble before him. Right? Like David, we need to take our complaints, our troubles, our feelings, our desires, and we need to take them to the Lord. He cried out, he pleaded, but it was all directed to God. David had a choice to make. He could have felt all these things, bottled them up, been frustrated, and then just let them bottle up and deteriorate his soul. But instead, he cries out consistently to the Lord. And we need to do the same thing. 
You know, one of the things that I love about being a part of this Emmanuel Church family is that, uh, like many of you here, um, I get to, to volunteer as a community group leader, uh, kind of a small group leader that leads groups in the homes. Uh, I get paid uh, to help all of our community group leaders and other leaders do well in those settings, but I say that to say that many of us uh, sitting here today, we find ourselves in situations, not just ourselves, where we're fighting great battles, but we find ourselves in community with one another, people that are sitting right next to you in your row that are going through many hard situations. And the number one thing that I have found and as I've talked with other leaders have found is that the difference between people that let stuff come between them and God versus really putting God between them and their stuff is that they go to God with their hurts and their pains. They cry out consistently to him. They don't run away from him, but they press into him. You see, the natural desire when we're hurt is to run away from God, to, to shelter ourselves and to turn away. But God wants us to come to him, to cry out to him. It makes me think of those like World War II battle scenes. Uh, these are some Navajo code talkers uh, that were on there. But, you know, when you're fighting the battle, you don't just need your rifle uh, on your own to try and beat the enemy. You need your lines of communication to be opened back to your commanding officer. If you want to win the war, if you want to let, you know, be open in your communication, you got to have that communication line open, right? That's when you can not just talk about these are the circumstances we find ourselves in, but that's when you can also hear from the home base, so to speak, to know which way to go forward. We need to keep crying out to God consistently if we want to make sure that our stuff doesn't come between us and God. But what do we do when those lines of communication are open? Two things. First, we need to grieve graphically. Not graphically like cursing God out, but graphically in the sense that with vivid and very honest words, we pour out our hearts and our feelings to God. This is exactly what David did in verses 3 and 4, right? He says to God, my spirit faints within me. You know my way. In the path where I walk, they have hidden a trap for me. Look, look to my right and see. There is none who takes notice of me. None in which I can take refuge. No refuge remains for me. No one cares for my soul. David is grieving graphically. He's not holding back any punches. He's brutally honest with God. He literally says, God, listen up. My spirit is collapsing. I'm fainting in my soul. Ever felt like that? You can hear the anxiety in his voice as he laments the fact that anywhere he goes, there's a trap that's hidden for him. He can't find peace anywhere he goes because around any corner, there's a snare waiting for him. So what does he do? He's in a cave. Not only that, but God, David literally tells God, look at my right. Like, God, look at right here. Do you see who is here? That's right. Nobody. This is where the person should be that's guarding my life. Nobody is here. God, what are you doing? There is no refuge for my soul. And then like he's at the end of his witch, he's like literally nobody cares for me. This is a man who is grieving graphically. And when we're struggling, and that's how our heart feels, it's important that when we cry out to God, we grieve graphically to him. Even when God already knows what's going on inside of our hearts and minds. Earlier, Dave wrote Psalm 139, and in verses 1 to 4, this is what David said. He said, you have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise, you perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my laying down. You're familiar with every single one of my ways. Before a word is even on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. See, God already knows what's on our hearts before we say it, and yet David is the one that's saying all these things to the Lord. Like, you know, if you're a man of efficiency, a woman of efficiency, why do you even need to say something if it's already known? Well, I'm a parent, and many of you are parents, and many of you have been parented by parents. <laughs> and so if any of you have parents in your life or been a parent, you understand when your kid is having a bad day, you know it, and you want them to come talk to you about it. Why? Because that's when you're in relationship. That's when the stuff that the kid is going through can be supported by the parent. That's when we, when we grieve graphically, we cry out to the Lord and we do so with honest hearts, even though God already knows what's going on, that's when we put ourselves in a place to be cared for and supported by the Lord. So cry out consistently. 
Grieve graphically, and then <clears throat> ask authentically. Verses five to seven, <clears throat> David says, I cry out to you, O Lord. I say, you are my refuge, my portion in the land of the living. Attend to my cry, for I am brought very low. And then these last two words, he says, deliver me from my persecutors, for they are too strong for me. Bring me out of prison. Right? David asked authentically. He said, God, right, listen up. I have some things we've got to talk about. I need you to deliver me. There's nowhere that I can go that's safe. Deliver me from my persecutors. By the way, these guys, they're too strong for me. God, I'm helpless. I need you. And by the way, this hiding thing, this cave thing, God, my soul feels like I'm in prison. I need your deliverance. James says, ask God for wisdom. And then David shows us that we can ask authentically for exactly what we need in our circumstances. You see, God is powerful. I mean, do you believe that? Do you believe that God is actually powerful enough to enter into your circumstance and do something about it? You only ask something from somebody if you believe that there's an ability that they have to affect the outcome of the situation you're in. Maybe some of us aren't asking God because we don't actually think God will do anything about it. Ask authentically and then see if God does the impossible in your circumstance. Sometimes God will answer in powerful and miraculous ways, and we need to be asking specifically so that he can say, see, look at what I did. I did that because you asked me. But sometimes God might answer no. Sometimes he might have a different plan for you and for your circumstance, but ask authentically no matter what. So cry out consistently, grieve graphically, ask authentically, and then trust tenaciously. Throughout this entire prayer, David has been this mix of emotions, of fear on the one hand, but then faith, of reeling inside and yet reliance upon God, of being full of trepidation, but then also trust. In verse 3, even though David is grieving that his spirit is fainting within him, he declares, God, you know my way. In verse 4, even though he says, there's no refuge for me, in verse 5, he goes on to say, I cry out to you, O Lord, I say, you are my refuge my portion in the land of the living. Notice David didn't say, you're my portion in the land of the dead. He said, you're my portion in the land of the living. It sounds like a man who doesn't have any plans on dying, even though death is surrounding him. And then in verse seven, he completes this prayer by saying, bring me out of prison, and then these last three lines, that I may give thanks to your name. Your righteous will surround me, for you will deal bountifully with me. I mean, this isn't David uh, doing one of those guilt trip power plays like, oh, thanks for making your bed, hon. You know, it's like now you have to do it. No, this is G David tenaciously trusting God and saying, God, I trust you so much that I, I am banking on the fact that you will deal bountifully with me and that one day, even though I'm alone right now and nobody is here to guard my soul, that one day I will be surrounded by those who are righteous. David is tenaciously trusting God even though his mind and his heart are in a whirlwind of emotions. And we can trust God tenaciously even if our heart is in a whirlwind. So what cave are you in today? What's your cave story? Right? What pressures and situations do you find yourself in today that has put you in a dark place? Maybe it's uh, pain from seeing the people that you love dearly making really destructive decisions in their life. Maybe it's you yourself. You know that there's some decisions you're making right now uh, that is destroying things in your life. Maybe it's relationships that you find yourself in that are they're really tearing you down and pulling you away from God rather than towards him. Maybe it's just unrelenting, unreasonable expectations that you face day in and day out at work. Maybe it's a deteriorating health in your own body or someone you love be fear about the future and how you'll be provided for or how you can provide for those that you care for. Or maybe it's just simply taking the long and unavoidable grief journey following the loss of a loved one. Whatever your circumstances are, whatever cave you find yourself in, do what David did. Cry out consistently to the Lord. And then make sure you grieve graphically because God already knows what's on your heart. Ask authentically and then trust tenaciously that God will provide in his provision and in his wisdom what you need. 
But maybe you're here and you're thinking to yourself, hey, Brian, that's really great. But if you didn't notice, David got out of the cave. The only reason we have this psalm is because later on, when he was surrounded by all these people, he got to say, hey, God was good to me, so trust him. But guess what? Things aren't going so well for me. And quite frankly, I don't see these things changing. So now what? Well, that's why we don't just have David, but we also have a man named Paul to speak into our lives today. See, Paul was a really important uh, Jewish leader of his day, a Pharisee, and he was really good at being good. But he originally hated Jesus because uh, Jesus said it wasn't about being good, it was about him, and he didn't like that. Uh, Jesus was claimed to be this rescuer for people, this Messiah, and Paul didn't want anything to do with it until one day, miraculously, he, he met the resurrected and risen Jesus. And so he went back to the Jewish scriptures and what we consider our Old Testament and the Bibles that we carry around today, and he saw that indeed the whole Old Testament pointed to Jesus. From that point on, Paul dedicated his life to helping people know Jesus and grow to be like him. In fact, he was so committed to this mission that he was beaten on multiple occasions. He was shipwrecked. I hate being cold, so ocean water is like terrifying to me, right? He had true hunger. He was in prison multiple times, and literally he was stoned and left for dead. And by the way, he got bit by a bunch of snakes too, so that wasn't so good for him. But Paul experienced all of this hardship, but then on top of all that, God gave him something so that he wouldn't become conceited and prideful over the miraculous things that God had shown him. And so this is what Paul says to a group of followers of Jesus in a place called Corinth in a letter that he wrote and that we have in our Bibles from 2 Corinthians 12, 7 to 9a. He says this, so to keep me from becoming conceited, Because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Now, with everything that Paul had and would eventually go through, it's pretty incredible to think that God would intentionally put a thorn in his flesh, something uh, that would make Paul's journey painful. Now, we don't exactly know what that thorn in the flesh was. It wasn't like he walked through a briar patch and it got stuck, okay? Um, and we, he calls it a messenger of Satan. We don't know if it was a, a, a demon. We don't know if it was a physical ailment. We don't know what his trial was, but we know that it was incredibly painful for him. I mean, now, your boss might be getting under your skin, but if you literally refer to them as a messenger of Satan sent to harass you, uh, that's, a, that's a big step to take, and I wouldn't recommend it, right? <laughs> but that's what this was. Whatever he was going, he felt like this is literally something. I know it's from God, but man, it feels like Satan's tormenting me here. It was so painful that he pleaded with the Lord three times to remove it. I mean, think about it. When was the last time you pleaded about something? You only plead when, one, you're totally incapable of doing something about it yourself. You're helpless. You're at someone else's mercy. You plead. But also, it's when you're totally desperate that this thing is answered, right? I can't win the lottery, but I'm not pleading for it because, quite frankly, I don't care if I get it, right? You plead when you totally are helpless to get it and totally need it to be answered. And so three times, Paul goes to his loving God a God that he's willing to suffer incredible things for to say, God, this I want out of my life. I don't want to deal with this anymore. Not once, not twice, three times. And yet God doesn't say yes. It wasn't like David where David said, God, get me out of this cave. And God said yes. Paul, to Paul, he says, no, I know that you've suffered, but the answer is no. Instead, my grace is sufficient for you for my power is made perfect in your weakness. No one likes going through that pain, that suffering. And it's right for us, like Paul, like David, to ask that that gets removed. But when the ultimate goal of our weakness is to empower us with true strength, a strength that goes beyond our own capabilities and is really centered in God and his power through us, then there is some hope and some purpose in the process of being made weak. Again, we know that this was not just something that Paul encouraged with you know, encountered with like, oh, this is hard. Okay, Jesus is great. Let's just put a smile on our face. That's not how it worked. He pleaded with God. He wanted it gone. But Paul got to the spot, not overnight, but he got to the spot 
where he could say this in verses 9 and 10. He said, therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I'm content. I'm content with my weaknesses, with insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I'm weak, then I'm strong. Now, I know there's not just one or two of you here, but there's many of us here today that, are, that would consider ourselves to be in this exact same process that Paul found himself in today. We've been praying We've been pleading with God to take away whatever it is that we've been battling with, and the answer has been no. I'm not going to take it away. But if that's what you've been praying, then my prayer is that, like Paul, God would bring you to a spot where you would be able to step into his promise that his grace really is sufficient for you. Why? Because in our weakness, we stop resting on ourselves and we place our trust and our strength in Jesus Christ. Pastor Joe, uh, one of our longtime and loved pastors here, he said this to me. He said, don't trust anyone who doesn't walk with a limp or have a scar. (laughs) For those of you who know Joe, you're like, yep, he could totally say something like that, right? But his point was that in the difficult and painful situations in life, that's when God does his best work. It's when we really grow to be like him. And so if you're in the process of getting a limp, or if that wound is feeling like it's going to become a scar, just know that God wants to use these things to give you real strength. Well, maybe you're sitting here today and thinking, okay, Brian, all that sounds nice and everything, and maybe Paul experienced a little bit of grace and maybe some peace no matter his circumstances, but let's face it, he was beheaded, (laughs) okay? And that doesn't sound an awful lot like winning at the end of the day. He suffered a lot, and then he died, And if I'm going to live my life, uh, that's not good enough for me. Well, if that's you, then no, that's why we have our fourth person to look at. That's why we have Jesus to look at. Not just for wishful thinking and cheap comfort, but for true, lasting, and eternal hope. You see, our greatest wound that we have in our life um, that needed to be healed is our wound caused by sin in our life. Our separation from God. And the pain that it causes not just in our own lives, but in our world. Our greatest battle that needed to be fighting wasn't a battle against cancer or against the enemies that we feel like we have in our life. Our greatest battle was against sin and Satan and death. And the greatest need that we have ever ever needed to have be met was our need to be restored into a right relationship with God our Father. The same God who, who made you, he knows you, he knows what you're going through, he knows the number of hairs on your head, he knows the days that you were going to be born, the day that you've lived, and the days you're going to die. And it was in love that he sent his son to bind up those wounds, to fight those battles, and to meet your greatest need all for you. If there's anyone who proved to us without a shadow of doubt that we can put our tenacious trust in a God, no matter what situations we face, it was Jesus. Because he experienced victory on the cross. You see, Jesus, he proved that in this world we're going to have trouble and hardship, but we can take heart because somebody, him, he has overcome this world. The path that Jesus took, it looked an awful lot like losing. He suffered, he bled, and he died. But unlike us, apart from Christ, he came back alive. Three days later, after dying on the cross, he came out of the tomb. He proved to us that there's more to this life than just this life, that there's life after death, and that all those who trust in Jesus have that hope, have that not wishful thinking, but that confident hope that God knows our pain, he knows our battles, and he's done something about it. He sent Jesus. And so if you and I want to encounter our trials, if we want to have a prayer life that can survive the trials that we go through, if we want to make sure that the stuff of our life doesn't come between us and God, that we need to turn to Jesus. My hope and my prayer and my eager expectation for each one of us is that as we realize that our our victory in this world many times is not going to come this side of heaven. As we realize that Jesus was the only one that could make heaven available to us, eternal life with Jesus, as as we lean into that, rather than pinning our hopes on every single thing in this world being tied up in a nice pretty bow at the end, when our hope is really in Jesus, that is when 
we can really put God between us and our stuff and experience the amazing grace that he has to offer. We've been looking at people in the Bible, but sometimes we need people closer to us to help us just kind of put skin on what we've been talking about today. And so I want us to just take a a quick look um, at a story of two people who call Emmanuel home that every single day are choosing daily to embrace the grace that Jesus made possible as they walk a very difficult road, crying out daily to God, but also tenaciously trusting who he is. Take a look now at the screens as we look at the story of Nelson and Glinda Elrod. My name is Nelson Elrod. This is my wife, Glenda. Uh, Today is our 48th anniversary. Uh, We have three children, two boys and our daughter, Joanna. We have eight grandchildren and four great-grandchildren. And uh, God has blessed us in so many ways. He saw us through many difficult times. Uh, Glenda has always been the rock. She's been with me through my cancer, heart attacks. But two years ago, the role was changed. Two years ago, Joanna and I, we talked and seemed like Glenda was forgetting a lot of small things, you know, minor things. And then they become to get a little more. She couldn't remember where the stuff in the kitchen went when she emptied the dishwasher. She couldn't remember if she had taken her medicine and stuff like that. So we took, well, the three of us went to the doctor. And we found out that she had Alzheimer's dementia. At first, I had really, really horrible headaches, and I just couldn't get rid of them. And in fact, I actually told my family I'd never thought of committing suicide, but after going through those headaches, I could honestly understand why some people do it. Because when it's a constant headache and nothing helps it to go away, and, uh, but, I'm so thankful that God gave Nelson and Joanna wisdom to find supplements for the brain. The headaches are gone. God took care. You don't want to see someone standing there in front of you and lose them, knowing tomorrow, is she going to know who I am? Is she going to know who our kids are? And even with some of the supplements and vitamins that she's on. We still lose a little bit of her every day. It was chaos inside me. You work your whole life and you plan on the so-called golden years of us doing stuff together. But I, I, I thought, God, why her? She has been so faithful to you. She depends on you for her very existence. She's so faithful to read her Bible and she talks with you every day. And I guess hurt would be the word. I was hurt that God would let our family go through this. I think it's harder for him than for me because Alzheimer was hereditary in my dad's side of the family. So when the doctor said I had it, I thought, well, I'm not really surprised. But then I told Nelson, I'm not going to worry about Alzheimer's because God is in control of my life. I think the first time I prayed was if it was his will to heal my body and stop the headaches, that that would be great, but otherwise I wanted his perfect will for my life. Without prayer, I don't know, I think I'd go berserk, you know, Um, because that's just been a part of my life for so many years, and God's brought me through a lot of things. 
And I praise Him for that. In my prayer life, since this came about, I find sometimes I'm praying selfishly. I think it's only natural under the circumstances when someone you've been with the majority of your life, their life is turning upside down and your hands are tied except to be there and hold their hand. But then I always come back to what I truly believe in is God your will be done not mine but your will be done just give me the strength to accept it no matter what it is God knows the desires in our heart before we ever utter them and a lot of times that's what God hears is your heart not your mouth and that's what we need to remember if you have a selfish heart in your prayer life, then God's going to hear that. But if you have a true, sincere love in your heart, God will hear that. But we still laugh. A lot of times when I'm by myself, I cry. But without prayer, without knowing, that God is in control. I don't know how people can go through something like this. Not having a rock to stand on, to know that it's always gonna be there and that God is the same today, tomorrow, just as he was yesterday. And so no matter what happens in the future, we can depend on God.